This is the second part of a video on designing a CPU. In this part of the video, we're going to look at the control unit. So if we take a look at the diagram which we've seen previously with the control unit, we'll see that there are 21 different lines that run into the control unit and these are all the sets and the enables from all of the other parts of the CPU. So this is the control unit here and you can see these are all of the lines that we're interested in and the control unit controls all of these sets and all of the enables and also the output code for the ALU. So when we write a program, the program controls all of these lines and makes them go either high or low in a particular sequence. And this allows the sets and enables to go high and low, which allows information to flow round about the elements of the CPU in a certain sequence. This is what our program does. If you like, this is the hardware software interface. The software tells us how to switch and the hardware actually does the switching. Now, if we take a look at the diagram below, this is going to show the start of the control section. So this is the start of the control section here. Now we're going to start off with a counter. We've called it a stepper here, but all it does is it just counts. It counts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then it goes back to the beginning again, and it counts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And you can see at the moment it's sitting at 1, 2, 3, 4. So the dark green tells us that this line is live. So it's sitting at position 4 at the moment. The next position will be position 5, 6, 7, and then 1 again. Now you'll see along the left hand side here, we've got gates. Now these are AND gates. The truth table for these dictates that whenever both inputs go high, we get a high output. But if any of the inputs are low, then we'll get a low output. So for example, if there's a 1 and a 1 here, we'll get a 1 here. If there's a 0 and a 0, we'll get a 0. If there's a 0 and a 1, we'll get a 0. Or a 1 and a 0, we'll get a 0. So we've got two banks of these AND gates. And one of the inputs is coming from the clock, but you'll see here this is a clock enable. It's maybe quite small there, but it actually says E. So this is clock enable. And it goes into each of the AND gates. And you can see in the right hand side, the clock here is the clock set. So this is a clock and each of the, the clock is into each of these AND gates. So on the left hand side, we have all of the enable controls and on the right hand side we have all of the set controls. So for example, if the clock enable was to go high, then we could give an output on say for example the RAM enable by making this line here go high or equivalently we could have an output in the accumulator enable by making this line here go high. So we've got all of the enables here, the RAM enable, accumulator enable, R0, 0, 1, 2 and 3 enables on the left hand side. And on the right hand side we've got the sets, memory address register set, accumulator set, RAM set, attempt set and R0, 1, 2, 3 and 4 sets. So this allows us to pulse each of these sets and enables in a particular order. So this is nothing other than setting these lines high or low inside this control unit. So what we can do is we can decide on what particular enable or set goes high or low and when it goes high or low depending on this hard wiring. So for example, I could connect this position 4 and I could connect it into the R1 enable. So this means that whenever the clock enable goes high and the R1 
goes high here, then the enable here will go high. And I could take a connection in here, and you can see that whenever the clock set goes high, the temp set value will go high. And then whenever we move on to the next pulse, this point here would have moved to there. And in this instance here, we would come down here and the R0 enable would go high. And we could set it up so that the accumulator would go high. Equally, when we go to the next line here, we could set it up so that the accumulator enable goes high. And also down here, we could set it up so that the R3 set goes high. So remember, these ones will only go high whenever they actually get the clock set coming in. And these will only go high whenever we get the clock enable coming in. And also whenever they're connected down through the stepper. So this allows us to control information flowing about the computer. So if we were to say in this instance then, well, where is our program? Well, in this instance, our program is the connections between the stepper and these AND gates. And what we could do is we could change those connections. And as we change the connections, we'll change the sets and enables on the CPU and we'll get it to do lots of different things. So right now, it doesn't seem particularly useful because what we have here is a hardwired CPU. That is, we can only do this one function. So it would count along and it would do this one function, this one and this one, and then it would come across and it would do this and this, and then it would do this one and that one. And then it would count to seven. It would go back to one and it would count through again and it would do exactly the same thing. So in order for it to, us to get it to do something different, what we would have to do is we'd have to allow this counter to count along. And when it gets to the end, we would have to stop it. And then we would have to rewire these wires in order to get the different lot of sets and enables to pulse at a different times. And then when we went round again, we would have to stop the CPU again and then we would have to rewire it again. So this rewiring of this CPU in effect is us running a program. So this really is the heart of the hardware software interface. The software tells us how to rewire these wires in a particular order. And the hardware is the actual wires themselves. So let's start our very first program. In this program, we're going to add two numbers together. So we're going to have the number five in register R1, and we're going to have the number seven in register R0. We're going to add them the two together. We'll get the number 12, and that'll sit in register R3. So let's say, for example, we start off here, and the, we're in position one. The clock here, will count along until it gets to position 4. At position 4, you can see what's going to happen is that the R1 is enabled whenever the clock enable goes high. So what that does is it puts the number 5 from R1 onto the bus. So remember, all we're doing here is we're taking the number 5 which is in here and we put it onto the bus by making this enable go high and we make the enable go high from within the control unit. So also, once the clock enable has gone high, we have to wait until the clock set goes high. So now the, we wait for a certain length of time and the clock set will go high. And what we'll do here is we'll take that number five and we'll store it in the temp register. So we take the number five, which is on the bus, and we store it in the temp register. So whenever the set clock goes low, and then the enable clock goes low, 
that number 5 is stored in the temp register. So now what we've got to do is we've got to go and get the number 7. So we go on to the next clock pulse and in the next clock pulse the enable goes high again in this instance here the R0 the contains the number R0 contains the number 7 so it means that the number 7 is going to go on to the bus so if we come up here we'll see that R0 in this case is actually called R1 so it's this one here will go high and that means that the contents of this register will go onto the bus so that'll be a number 7 will go onto the bus but that number 7 will come through and it will sit just at this point here. Now we've set it up so that the value on the outputs here for the opcode for the ALU is sitting, sitting at 000, so we haven't actually designed this into the, the simulation yet, but we make the assumption that these are sitting at zero. When they're sitting at zero, it's, we have the add function here. So we've got a five in here and a seven in here. It automatically adds these together, and the output sits here just at the accumulator. So what we can do is we can then set the accumulator, that is we can read the information into the accumulator. So this is the sum, which is the value of 12. So this is the accumulator set here. So now we've got 12 sitting in the accumulator. What we want to do is we want to take that number 12 and we want to put it into register R3. So the clock pulse for the set goes low, the enable goes low, and then we clock it along to the next point. At the next, next point here, the enable goes high again. And we can see that we en enable the accumulator, that is we take the number 12 from the accumulator and put it back on to the bus. And then whenever the set goes high, we take that number 12 and we set it into register R3. So register R3 will contain the answer 12. The set, the set pulse goes low and then the enable pulse goes low. And we will have the number 12 sitting in the register R3. And that's us work through our very first program. But of course, this is just going to continually do that all the time. And the actual code that we have or the program is just the position of the wires, which tells the sets and enables to do certain things at certain times. But we want to be a little bit smarter than this. We want to actually build in a system that changes these wire positions automatically. And that's what we're going to look at next. Now what we're going to do is we're going to create another register. So this is just a storage location, the same as the registers R0, 1, 2 and 3. And these are going to have an 8-bit number. So this 8-bit number, in effect, is going to tell us how to rewire these connections. And then whenever we come along to the end and start again at this point, those same 8-bit, another lot of 8-bit numbers is going to come in, and it's going to tell us how to do the rewiring again. And then another lot of 8-bit numbers is going to come in and tell us how to do the rewiring. So this continual addition of these 8-bit numbers into this unit is our actual program. So each of them is an instruction. An instruction just tells us how to wire these up. Now it's beyond the scope of this small video to describe the entire circuit. So what I'll do is I'll just show you the circuit. And if you're interested you can always go and do the full course. So here's the circuit down here. And this is the final control circuit. But as you can see, it's nothing other than the original stepper, all of the sets down the right hand side, all of the enables down the left hand side. Now we've got a special input register here, and this is the called the instruction register, and it contains the 
all the uh, code or the instructions which make up our program. And these instructions come in here, remember they're just zeros and ones, and they control the flow of information, that is they control which sets and which enables turn on and off at particular times. So rather than us having to go in and physically rewire things, the rewiring is taken care of automatically and we are able to do exactly as the instructions tell us. Now that's an explanation of sorts, but in order to go through this full control unit, it's going to take a little bit of time. And if you're interested, you can always go and have a look at the course. But ostensibly, all we're doing is just rewiring these connections to control sets and enables. And that's how a computer program works. So what are these instructions that tell us how to rewire the control unit? Well, we've got one of the instructions down below. And if we were to gather all of our instructions together, we could create an assembly language. So let's have a look, first of all, at an ALU instruction. That is an instruction which controls the flow of information round about the CPU, but also uses the arithmetic logic unit. So here's an example here. So this is the instruction. This is what tells us how to rewire our control unit. So if there's a number one as of the first unit here, we know it's an ALU instruction. The next three numbers will tell us whether it's going to be an add, shift right, shift left, not, and, or, exclusive or, or a compare. So these are the different functions that can be performed within the ALU. And these are determined by these numbers. So for example, if we wanted to add two numbers together, so we would have one, and we would have 000, zero, zero. that would be telling us that it's an ALU instruction, the instruction is an add instruction. We would then have these two bits here, which would be telling us where the number is that we're expecting to add. In this case here, the number could be an R0, 1, 2, or 3. And the second part here tells us where we the second number is going to be. So the second number, again, is going to be in R0, 1, 2, or 3. Now, you may be looking at this and thinking, yeah, that's okay. You, you've kind of jumped from uh, the hardware, which is an actual, uh, the actual uh, control unit design, block design with ands and ors, and now all of a sudden you've jumped up to instructions. Well, remember that what you see here with this instruction is nothing other than just the Boolean equivalent of the control unit. Okay, so that is basically the control unit here, but it's written in a nice little Boolean form that's easy for us humans to understand. That is, it's, we've abstracted it, we've created something that only in this case here, exists in terms of AND gates and OR gates and logical functions and zeros and ones. And we've rewritten it in a manner which is a little bit more palatable and easier for humans to understand. But it is nothing other than the circuit we see here. We've designed this circuit and we've designed it to work in a specific way. And the specific way this circuit is going to work, as an example, using the ALU is in this particular manner. Okay, so this is nothing other than that circuit. So this is our first ALU instruction. And we can generate different types of instructions, not only arithmetic logic unit instructions, but we can also generate different types of jump instructions, which will jump to different parts of the program. And we can also shift information about so we can um, we can add data in we can store data we can move data from register to a ram or ram to a register and vice versa so what we can do is we can generate a whole load of these 
ALU instructions. But remember, all the ALU instructions are just the control unit, but written in a Boolean form. And then we've abstracted it from this zeros and ones. And instead of having zero, 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 we replace this in our own head with the one words add. So it just makes it easier for us the humans to understand and generate code that will run in this CPU. So let's have a look at our actual assembly language. And these are all of our assembly language instructions. So we've got an add instruction. We've got a SHR, which is a shift right instruction. We've got our no and or exclusive or. We've got our data. We've got our jump register. We've got our jump. And these other ones here are jump depending on particular flags. Now we'll get into the flags just in a minute, but these are just other instructions. And these are the registers. So this is our entire instruction set that we've created. But remember, this is just a representation of the control unit logic which we've designed. So let's have a look at uh, some actual assembly language code. So previously we've generated individual instructions, but in order for it, the machine to be useful, we want to take the instructions and we want to go through them one line at a time. So in effect, this is us, the control unit receiving an instruction, and then it would go through the instruction. And at the end, we would stop for a little second. In our own heads, imagine we would stop and then we would wait for the next instruction to come in to the control unit. And then we would continue with the stepper and the stepper or the counter in, in the control unit. And it would move through the different lines that we need to in order to generate the actual output. So here's three of the programs we have here. And these programs are written in our assembly language. So here's an algorithm. The first one is an algorithm that will, go, will divide two numbers. And here's an algorithm that will subtract two numbers. And here's an algorithm that will create and generate the Fibonacci numbers. But these are just our instructions. And remember our instructions here are just a mnemonic to make things easy for us. Now we've also I've also written an assembler. Now, an assembler is quite a simple thing. All the assembler does is, once we've written our code, the assembler goes in and it replaces the code we have with actual ones and zeros. So for example, if we have this first line of code and it is data, R0, and then all zeros, I would take the data instruction and it would replace the data instruction with the actual numbers, that is the zeros and ones, which is the actual instruction that the computer understands. So all our assembler does is it just changes these codes, these instructions, into the zeros and ones that the computer understands. And you can do that with a simple lookup. Now, if we want to write assembly language code, and we want to check and see whether it's actually going to work. It's going to be quite difficult and time consuming if all we are able to do is, once we've created the code, to run it on the CPU. Rather, what we'd like to do is we'd like to take the code and actually run it in software, first of all. That is, we want to create the actual CPU, but we want to model the CPU on a computer and then run the code on a computer. Because then if we run a code on a computer, it can run lightning fast and then you can find out and you can work out whether you've got any errors in your code. That is, you can create a debugger which allows you to write the assembly language code and allows you to run through the code rather than running it on the CPU initially. So this, in effect, is like 
a test bench and it's a the exact um, copy or all, almost exact copy of the CPU that you've designed but it's been uh, designed and simulated in this instance here I've designed and simulated it in Excel VBA so say for example we have the code here so I could write all the code out here and I could run through it one line at a time and as it runs through one line at a time I can trace exactly what happens to all of the registers the memory address register, register R1, R0, R2, the instruction register, the counter and I can look at all of these things called flags which I'll get onto in a moment and I can check each line and see whether the code is actually running properly or not and once I've ran through this, again it will run lightning fast if I get the right answer then I can work under the assumption that the code is, should be okay so rather than writing and debugging the code live on the CPU I'm doing it on this debugger which makes it a lot quicker and a lot more efficient and it makes it easier to debug and work out if where your errors are so once I've done this I can take this code and I can export it and I can export it onto the final CPU so this is the final CPU here and it's just much the same as we've seen above there's a few extra little blocks and there's a little bit of extra circuitry but all of the extra circuitry has been added just to help us load the program into the computer into the CPU so this is the top level here well it's not quite the top level it's one below the top level but it's the actual CPU so let's look at each of the blocks we're going to have the ALU the control unit we're going to have the RAM so there's the ALU there and again if you decide to do the course we'll work through the entire design of this ALU and you can see that we've got an adder shift right shift left not and or and we've got an exclusive or here and you come down here and we've got the RAM so this is 256 byte RAM and you can see that it looks complicated but it's not that complicated it's just that um, it, there's just a lot of repetition within the actual block so this RAM here holds or stores the program now it's beyond the scope of this blog to go through all of the RAM in detail but if you do the course we will cover the design of the RAM completely and as we said this is the control unit so this is the interesting part of the design and this is the this is where you get to by designing the control unit yourself you can design the uh, exactly how you want your CPU to work that is you, you can design your instructions and you can decide what instructions your, your computer is going to have and from this you can then go ahead and you can take your instructions you can create your mnemonics which will generate your assembly language so all that comes from the control unit now finally what we're going to do is we're going to actually run some simulations so when we run the simulations we want to be able to see what happens so this is the very top level this is our CPU here and what I've done is I've taken out some of the interesting things that were things that were interested in for example the value on the bus the value in the accumulator the value in this thing called instruction address register and what's the value of the thing in the instruction register and R0, R1, R2 and R3 and this little block here loads up the program which you, you've written in your debugger and there's a few extra items here just to control the information on and off of the CPU so let's look at an exact actual program here and the process that we would go through in order to make the CPU work so to get our program working our CPU what we can do is we can write our program in assembly language we can test it in the debugger once it's working we can then output it via the assembler and create an executable file so that is actually the machine code we can then load the machine code into the CPU and we can run that code on the CPU and that will allow us to see here what the output is and we can compare the output with the debugger 
and we can see whether it gives us what we expect to see. So here's the sales bit. If you want to build and simulate the entire CPU from scratch and also see how we write an assembler, a simulator, and debugger in Excel, then just continue on to the full course. There's nine hours of lectures and all the designs you see I've seen above, they're all fully explained. So in a nutshell, if you want to understand how a computer works, then why not design, build and simulate the entire fully functioning 8-bit CPU along with me? So if you are interested in the course, you can always click on the links and it'll take you through to the course. So that's all for this blog and this is all the blog now finished for the Design a CPU course. So thank you for listening. Goodbye.